Letter from St. Pro to Eloisa by Jean Jacques Rousseau. From Eloisa, or a series of original letters collected and published by J. J. Rousseau. Taken from the Monthly Review, Volume 25, 1761. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I enter with a secret horror on this vast desert, the world, whose confused prospect appears to me only as a frightful scene of solitude and silence. In vain my soul endeavors to shake off the universal restraint it lies under. It was a saying of a celebrated ancient that he was never less alone than when he was by himself. For my part, I am never alone but when I mix with the crowd, and am neither with you nor with anybody else. My heart would speak, but it feels there is none to hear. It is ready to answer, but no one speaks anything that regards it. I understand not the language of the country, and nobody here understands mine. Yet I own that I am greatly caressed, and that all the obliging offices of friendship and civility are readily offered to me. This is the very thing of which I complain. The officious zeal of thousands is ever on the wing to oblige me, but I know not how to entertain immediately a friendship for men I have never seen before the honest feelings of humanity the plain and affected openness of a frank heart are expressed in a different manner from those false appearances of politeness and that external flattery which the customs of the world require i am not a little afraid that he who treats me at first sight as if i were a friend of twenty years standing if at the end of twenty years i should want his assistance will treat me as a stranger and when i see men lost in dissipation pretend to take so tender a part in the concerns of every one i readily presume they are interested for nobody but themselves there is however some truth in all this profession the french are naturally good-natured open hospitable and generous but they have a thousand modes of expression which are not to be too strictly understood a thousand apparent offers of kindness which they make only to be refused they are no more than the snares of politeness laid for rustic simplicity i never before heard such profusion of promises you may depend on my serving you command my credit my purse my house my equipage but if all this were sincere and literally taken there would not be a people upon earth less attached to property. The community of possessions would be in a manner already established, the rich always making offers, and the poor accepting them. Both would naturally soon come upon a level, and not the citizens of Sparta itself could ever have been more upon an equality than would be the people of Paris. On the contrary, there is not a place perhaps in the world where the fortunes of men are so unequal, where are displayed at once the most sumptuous opulence and the most deplorable poverty. This is surely sufficient to prove the insignificance of that apparent commiseration which every one here affects to have for the wants and sufferings of others, and that tenderness of heart which in a moment contracts eternal friendship. But if, instead of attending to possessions so justly to be suspected and assurances so liable to deceive, I desire information and would seek knowledge, here is its most agreeable source. One is immediately charmed with the good sense which is to be met with in company of the French, not only among the learned, but with men of all ranks and even among the women the turn of conversation is always easy and natural it is neither dull nor frivolous but learned without pedantry gay without noise polite without affectation gallant without being fulsome and jocose without immodesty their discourse is neither made up of dissertations nor epigrams they reason without argumentation 
and are witty without punning they artfully unite reason and vivacity maxims and rhapsodies and mix the most pointed satire and refined flattery with strictness of morals they talk about everything because every one has something to say they examine nothing to the bottom for fear of being tedious but propose matters in a cursory manner and treat them with rapidity every one gives his opinion and supports it in few words no one attacks with virulence that of another nor obstinately defends his own they discuss the point only for the sake of improvement and stop before it comes to a dispute every one improves every one amuses himself and they part all satisfied with each other even the philosopher himself carrying away something worthy his private meditation but after all what kind of knowledge do you think is to be gained from such agreeable conversation to form a just judgment of life and manners to make a right use of society to know at least the people with whom we converse there is nothing eloisa of all this all they teach is to please artfully the cause of falsehood to confound by their philosophy all the principles of virtue to throw a false collar by the help of sophistry on the passions and prejudices of mankind and to give a certain turn to error agreeable to the fashionable mode of thinking it is not necessary to know the characters of men but their interests to guess their sentiments on any occasion when a man talks on any subject he rather expresses the opinions of his garb or his fraternity than his own and will change them as often as he changes his situation and circumstances dress him up for instance by turns in the robe of a judge a peer and a divine and you shall hear him successfully stand up with the same zeal for the rights of people the despotism of the prince and the authority of the inquisition there is one kind of reason for the lawyer another for the officer of the revenue and a third for the soldier each of them can demonstrate the other two to be knaves a conclusion not very difficult to be drawn by all three thus men do not speak their own sentiments but those they would instil into others and the zeal which they affect is only the mask of interest you may imagine however that such persons as are unconnected and independent have at least a personal character and an opinion of their own not at all they are only different machines which never think for themselves but are set to going by springs you need only inform yourself of their company their clubs their friends the women they visit the authors they are acquainted with and you may immediately tell what will be their opinion of the next book that is published the next play that is acted the works of this and that writer they know nothing of or this or that system of which they have not one idea as ordinary clocks also are wound up to go but four and twenty hours so are these people under the necessity of going every evening into company to know what they are to think the next day hence it is that there is but a small number of both sexes who think for all the rest and for whom all the rest talk and act as every one considers his own particular interest and none of them that of the public and as the interests of individuals are always opposite there is among them a perpetual clashing of parties and cabals a continual ebb and flow of propositions and contrary opinions amidst which the most violent tempers agitated only by the rest seldom understand a word of the matter in dispute every club has its rules its opinions its principles which are nowhere else admitted an honest man at one house is a knave at the next door the good the bad the beautiful the ugly truth and even virtue itself have all only a limited and local existence
whoever chooses a general acquaintance therefore and goes into different societies should be more pliable than alcibiades he should change his principles with his company new model his sentiments in a manner at every step and lay down his maxims by the rod he ought at every visit to leave his conscience if he has one at the door and take up with that belonging to the house as a new servant on his entrance puts on its livery which he leaves behind him when turned out and if he chooses it again takes up his own which serves him till he gets a new suit with a new place but what is still more extraordinary is that every one here is perpetually contradicting himself without being concerned at all about it they have one set of principles for conversation and another for their actions nor is anybody scandalized at their inconsistency it being generally agreed they should be very different it is not required of an author particularly of a moral writer that he should maintain in conversation what he advances in his works nor that he should put in practice what he inculcates his writings conversation and conduct are three things essentially different which he is not at all obliged to reconcile to each other in a word everything is absurd and yet nothing offends because absurdity is the fashion nay there is attached to this incongruity of principles and manners a fashionable air of which they are proud and which is frequently affected in fact although every one zealously preaches up the maxims of his profession he piques himself on the carriage and manners of another the attorney for instance assumes the martial air of a soldier and a petty clerk of the customs the supercilious deportment of a lord the bishop affects the gallantry of a fine gentleman the courtier the precision of a philosopher and the statesman the repartee and raillery of a wit even the plain mechanic who knows not how to put on the airs of any other profession dresses himself up in a suit of black on sundays in order to pass for a practitioner in the law the military gentlemen alone despising every other profession preserve without affectation the manners of their own which to say the truth is insufferable not that m de marot was in the wrong when he gave the preference to the conversation of a soldier but what might be true in his time is no longer so now the progress of literature has since improved conversation in general and as the gentlemen of the army despised such improvement in theirs that which used to be the best is at length become the worst hence it is that persons we talk to are not those with whom we converse their sentiments do not come from the heart their knowledge is not the acquisition of their own genius their conversation does not discover their thoughts and one perceives nothing of them but their figure thus a man in company here is nearly in the same situation as if he were spectator of a moving picture where he himself is the only figure capable of self-motion End of Letter of Saint Pro to Eloisa by Jean Jacques Rousseau from Eloisa, or a series of original letters collected and published by J. J. Rousseau, taken from the Monthly Review, Volume 25, 1761.